Good morning, brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. As we return to our studies and the discussion that was being held this last Sabbath, shall we seek our Heavenly Father's guidance, his wisdom, and his blessing, so that we may more clearly understand that which is to be presented before us at this time? Shall we now seek him in, in by a word of prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, as we come before you today on this Sabbath, we recognize our great need of you. Father, we have sinned. We have fallen short of your glory. We seek you to guide us. We seek your face and we seek your blessing. We ask now, Father, as we open your word, as we look to be guided by you, by your spirit, that our minds might be open. I ask today, Father, that it be your words, your instruction that comes forward, that your cross alone may be seen. That you may be glorified. That you may be shown in all things of which we discuss and of which we study. Please join with us now. Help us to understand, open our minds, and may light shine so that we may more clearly understand that which you would have us to understand. I thank you for those that are attending this meeting and for those that will view this later on the internet. For this, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, last week, Brother Theodore did a wonderful job while I was incapacitated. There was a lot of things that were being brought back together, especially after these studies in this with these minor prophets. But let us not forget, as the initial premise of these studies had been, that we are to be comparing what we are seeing with the minor prophets with what book? With the book of Daniel with the minor prophets. Right. Now, last week, we got into a conversation, as I listened to this, about the different visions. And there were, we were addressing a bit regarding the Calzone, the Marais, and the Mara. Yet, how does this, these visions, how are these visions recorded in scripture? How are they to be shown in scripture? I'm not sure I understand the question. There's a reason. <clears throat> if we are to look to compare this and these visions with that in the book of Daniel, how does Daniel present the understanding of these visions?
Okay, let's open the Bible to Daniel 8.13. If someone could read Daniel 8.13, please. Okay, well, Daniel 8.13, of course, addresses Palmoni. Correct. So I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint, which is Palmoni, which, which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation? Think about the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. Okay, now, as we have come to understand... When Palmoni, the wonderful number, the number of secrets, is speaking, there is another that is asking a question. How long shall be the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation? What vision is being referred to here? Well, we know this is the 2520. Right. Now, and, and it's kind of interesting here because, you know, we often talk about it being the 2520 from 677 to 1844. Uh, but actually here, it's really talking about the 2520 from 723 to 1798. Exactly. So we are looking at the vision, the calzone, the panoramic vision, as Elder Jeff would have presented it. But here we are looking at the vision as Hiram Edson would have presented it. Right? Right. So in uh, 1856, uh, Hiram Edson does those seven articles on uh, the times of the Gentiles, right? right? So he's going to introduce, even though uh, this was partially recognized by Miller, he's just going to say, well, this 2520 for Northern Israel is the primary application of the seven times right but of course both are correct but um here in this in daniel 8 13 it is talking about that 25 20 from northern israel and then it's going to refer to the 2300 days which is going to be tied to the 25 20 for judah because they have the same end point right But here we are right now. This vision, this panoramic vision, this calzone is denominated and delineated by Daniel as being the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation. It is the vision of paganism and papalism. Would anyone disagree with that statement? Okay, say that again. Here we have this vision, this panoramic vision, the calzone. This is delineated and denominated as the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation. And this vision is the vision of paganism and papalism. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. But so we are, we are dealing with a vision of self-exaltation. Mm-hmm. The vision that places ourselves 
above the word of God. That places man above the word of God. So, if this is indeed the case, then this vision that troubled Daniel so much, the Mare, how is this vision denominated within this book? And here we're addressing this because this is going we're we're going to go into this a bit more deeply in some of the presentations that I will be giving at the camp meeting. So what is this vision that troubles Daniel? Uh, morning and evening vision agreed brother but what else is this vision well it's the marae whatever the mara whatever one you marae want to is correct but what else is it Well, the snapshot vision? I'm not sure what you mean. Okay. If we were to look at Daniel 8, 26. Here, the prophet Daniel makes the following note. Because he is hearing this. He, this is being told him. Mm -hmm. And the vision of the evening and the morning, which was told, is true. So here we have a vision of the evening and the morning. We have the vision of the Mare. And this vision is true. If something is true, is it correct? Well, yes. Who is providing this vision and the explanation of this vision to Daniel? Uh, well, Gabriel. And why is Gabriel providing this? I mean, why is it Gabriel or why is it being provided at all? Why is Gabriel providing this? Because uh, Daniel cannot understand the vision and uh, Pomona has uh, to explain through Gabriel. Right. But how can we prove that? Well, in verse 15, I mean, it says this man, which is, of course, Palmoni, he says to Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. Now. What? I said now. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> if we were to look at Revelation 1, verse 1. Comparing what we're seeing here from the book of Daniel with the book of Revelation, which, as we have come to understand, are actually one book, correct? Mm -hmm. Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. 
the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he, Jesus Christ, sent and signified it by his angel. And what angel does Christ use to signify these things? Gabriel. Unto his servant, John. So the steps are that the father gives the understanding to the son. The son gives the understanding to Gabriel. And Gabriel provides the understanding to the prophets. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So now we have this situation. Because as was being addressed this last Sabbath, we have this third vision. Daniel experienced the third vision. Many others have experienced this third vision. It is a third vision that in scripture, in the Hebrew, would be called the Mara. Now, what is it about the Mara that is different from the vision that is true and the vision of the daily and the transgression of desolation. What's different? Yes, what's different about it? Is this not a more personal vision, a vision that makes those that behold the vision to fall on their face okay. as one that is dead? Is this, hmm. not a, is this not a vision that causes those that are beholding the vision to have to consider their sins? in comparison to that of Christ. Are they not being required to examine their own worthiness before Christ? Yeah, well, that's the purpose of it. Okay. So we have the looking glass, we have the vision that is true, and we have the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation. All three taken together. Now, the way that I've come to understand it is the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation represents in a very broad form the first angel's message that the vision that is true is representative of the second angel's message and that the looking glass vision is representative of the third angel's message. Now, these are points that we're bringing out now because within a month, we are going to be holding a camp meeting. We are going to be examining many of the things that we have been studying. We are going to be looking as to where we stand currently in the line of prophetic history and in comparing ourselves with that line. <clears throat> so consider these things. They will be brought up again at the camp meeting. Zechariah 112. Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, 
How long wilt thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah against which thou hast had indignation these threescore and ten years? Now, as I believe was brought out last Sabbath, this 70-year period was the 70-year period of the desolation of the temple, correct? Yeah, and and this is still like 66 years since the temple was destroyed. So that means that this is a pre-prescribed um, period of 70 years that the angel is referring to. Right. And the Lord answered the angel that talked with me with good words and comfortable words. The steady advancement made by the builders of the temple greatly discomfited and alarmed the host of evil. Why? Why was this alarming the hosts of evil? Well, because the, God's people would end up uh, setting up the, the temple again, and they could be a, a light to the world, right? Would it also not be that these people, God's people, were seeking to come into unity with him? Mm -hmm. They were seeking to be restored in spirit and in truth to what he would have us to understand mm -hmm. now there's there was a, a comment in the chat that we should be comparing genesis 49 21 and deuteronomy 33 23 with the verse from zechariah zechariah 1 13 why Because where it speaks of good words, <clears throat> it made me think of these verses. Naphtali is a hind let loose. He giveth goodly words. That's Genesis 49, 21. And Deuteronomy 33, 23 says, And of Naphtali, he said, O Naphtali, satisfied with favor and full with the blessing of the Lord, possess thou the west and the south. I guess it's the gift of good words. And what better words can we have but? from the word of God, from God himself. Okay. And I also note that when we see ourselves as Christ sees us in all our frailties and yet his great, great mercy toward us, how can we exalt ourselves? It's impossible. Right. Satan determined to put forth still further effort to weaken and discourage God's people by holding before them their imperfections of character. Do we not experience this today? If those who had long suffered because of transgression could again be induced to disregard God's commandments, they would be brought once more under the bondage of sin. Because Israel had been chosen to preserve the knowledge of God in the earth, they had ever been the special objects of Satan's enmity. He was determined to cause their destruction. While they were obedient, he could do them no harm. Therefore, he had bent all his power and cunning to entice them into sin. And snared by his temptations, they had transgressed the law of God and had been left to become the prey of their enemies. Yet though they were carried as captives to Babylon, God did not forsake them. He sent his prophets to them with reproofs and warnings and aroused them to see their guilt. When they humbled themselves before God and returned to him with true repentance, he sent them messages of encouragement, 
declaring that he would deliver them from captivity to restore them to his favor and once more establish them in their own land. And now that this work of restoration had become, and a remnant of Israel had already returned to Judea, Satan was determined to frustrate the carrying out of the divine purpose. And to this end, he was seeking to move upon the heathen nations to destroy them utterly. Is this not what we're seeing is occurring right now within the movement? FFA was made fun of when Nashville was not destroyed on July 18th. Yet this message needed to go forward. It could not go forward when presented by a wolf in sheep's clothing. It could not go forward by those coldly rejecting the word of God. It needed to go forward in spirit and in truth. Was the message of July 18th wrong? No, it isn't. Just because God delays fulfilling his word doesn't mean that that word will not eventually be fulfilled. Right. But in this crisis, the Lord strengthened his people with good words and comfortable words. Through an impressive illustration of the work of Satan and the work of Christ, he showed the power of their mediator to vanquish the accuser of his people. Where is our faith to reside? Is our faith to be in man? No. No, it's to be in Christ. All right. So the angel that communed with me said unto me, <clears throat> Cry thou, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with great jealousy. Who is speaking here? Who is I am? Well, the Lord, Jehovah. And I am very sore displeased with the heathen that are at ease. For I was but a little displeased, and they helped toward this affliction. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies. My house shall be built in it, saith the Lord of hosts, and a line shall be stretched forth upon Jerusalem. Now, the next item that Mrs. White had written about this was a non-published manuscript. Friday, 20th of August of 1897. This is a great enterprise for this part of the country. Our school being established here demands that we arise and build. We cannot present to the Lord any meager offering. We want, when this work is done, to have done our best according to the light that God has given. We want to hear from the Lord the word of approval, as did the remnant who obeyed the voice of the Lord their God, coming to them through Haggai the prophet when they came and did the work in the house of the Lord of hosts, Haggai 1.14. The word of approval came, I am with, I am with you, saith the Lord, Haggai 2.4. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies. My house shall be built in it, 
saith the Lord of hosts, and a line shall be stretched forth upon Jerusalem. <clears throat> Zechariah 1, 16. Chapters 2, 3, 4, and 5 are chapters appropriate for our studies. We are to learn our lessons from these chapters, for history will be and is being repeated. Comment from the chat. The spirit of Laodiceanism is like unto heathenism, at ease, which is complacency and self-satisfaction. Agree or disagree? Agree. Okay. Cry yet, saying, thus saith the Lord of hosts. My cities through prosperity shall yet be spread abroad, and the Lord shall yet comfort Zion and shall yet choose Jerusalem. Then I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, four horns. And I said unto the angel that talked with me, What be these? And he answered me, these are the horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. And the Lord showed me four carpenters. And said I, what come these to do? And he spake, saying, these are the horns which have scattered Judah, so that no man did lift up his head. But these are come to fray them, to cast out the horns of the Gentiles, which lifted up their horn over the land of Judah to scatter it. How would we see the horns today? And how would we see these four carpenters, these four builders? You can look at the four horns. So, um, because Zechariah is going to deal with uh, the chariots and horses and all this as well. So this is a progressive destruction of four is how we would look at it okay this can so this can be applied in different ways obviously in this period of time it's going to be referring to, to uh babylon Medo, persia greece and rome okay and then the four carpenters would be the three angels messages plus the fourth that's one way of looking at it right um But you have it, uh, the horns, which obviously refer to political or military powers doing this persecution. Um, and, and then the craftsmen or carpenters. Uh, um, How would we look at this within the movement itself? <clears throat> well, this would just be the destruct the same thing within the movement it would be a history of destruction and then a history of rebuilding right right now and actually in the context here i think in the context here in zechariah this is not relating to ours but i think this would probably refer to the four seven times very much yeah. okay and then the the three messages the three decrees plus the fourth or the four carpenters right so we have ever ever more symbols that we're looking at here yeah so you can zoom in or zoom out and you can apply it of course in a repeat of history as well because ellen white said as the history is 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 being repeated correct um so we know that that occurs within our movement as well. Now, normally we would apply then the four, uh, the four horns to be the four generations, that what happens in the four generations. And then the reform line of uh, the four carpenters being the repeat of the first, second, third angel's message. Uh, what is it about a carpenter that, that 
is specific to what we've been studying? Well, the, the thing here that they talk about is this line where they use the measuring lines. Right. right. So, I mean, that's the whole idea is that there's going to be a line stretched upon Jerusalem. And when we think of the line, so remember that there's also in uh, Second Kings where it talks about this line of Samaria stretched over the line of Jerusalem. And there, those are lines of judgment and destruction. Those are the two 2520s, right? The one for northern Israel, the one for, for southern Israel. Uh, but the line, a measuring line can also be used for um, uh, building, right? Correct. So, so when you're constructing something like in Ezekiel chapter 40, and he's going to construct uh, the temple, he sees this temple, the city laid out, actually. And he's going to see this uh, measuring reed used to measure the temple. So, so a line can be a line of destruction or a line of construction. Right. I often think of it when I'm thinking of something like this, of a, a chalk line. Yeah, yeah. That's what I think of. Where you snap the chalk line to, you know, where you're going to put a wall or something like that. Right. And then also the plumb bob, those same uh, chalk lines you can use as a plumb bob. Exactly. Uh, make the wall straight. The messages delivered by Haggai and Zechariah roused the people to put forth every possible effort for the rebuilding of the temple. But as they worked, they were sadly harassed by the Samaritans and others who devised many hindrances. <clears throat> who were the Samaritans here? Were they not people descended? of the tribes of Israel, but that had chosen to intermarry with the heathens around them. Did they at one time not know the truth and had that truth become corrupted in their understanding? Uh, before you answer that question, just uh, can you switch, turn off your share there for a second? There you go. And, th and then here you're going to see this is a diagram of now what they have is here Assyria and Babylon with the four seven times. He doesn't mark this out. This isn't my diagram. Um, he doesn't mark this out as clearly as, as I would. But um, so he's going to have the four decrees. You see there? Yep. And then he's going to have the four horns. And what he's doing is Assyria and Babylon and pagan Rome and papal Rome. Whether that's the best way to do it, I don't know. But uh, I would have done that differently. But then you have the four car carpenters, the first, second, third angel's message, and then the fourth angel's message. Now, I don't quite agree with his idea, but I see why he's doing that. He's putting 1888 as the fourth angel's message. So he doesn't use the repeat of history that we do, but he's got the same kind of idea. Who put right. this together? Um, uh, his name is uh, Ricky Bakavoy. Okay. So he actually uses lots of our charts. And yeah, so, so Ricky Bakavoy there. Okay. Talk away. Yeah. But anyway, so you can go back to doing your share there. Okay. He, he uses charts. Uh, he studies my papers and he uses the uh, a lot of the things that I have to do with uh, the four seven times. He accepts the 2520. So, okay. He doesn't agree with everything that we do. Uh, 
On one occasion, the provincial officers of the Medo-Persian realm visited Jerusalem and requested the name of the one who had authorized the restoration of the building. Now, this is being placed in history in this way. Under what kingdom were these officers engaged? Well, this is Persia. So this is not Babylon. Mm -hmm. And this is not Greece. And this is not Rome. This is Medo-Persia. Mm -hmm. This is the nation known for its laws and adherence to its laws. If at that time the Jews had not been trusting in the Lord for guidance, this inquiry might have resulted disaster disastrously to them. But the eye of their God was upon the elders of the Jews that they could not cause them to cease till the matter came to Darius. Ezra 5 verse 5. The officers were answered so wisely <clears throat> that they decided to write a letter to Darius Histopses, then the ruler of Medio Persia, directing his attention to the original decree made by Cyrus, which commanded that the house of God at Jerusalem to be rebuilt and that the expenses for the same be paid from the king's treasury. Now, is there any question in our minds of exactly when this examination was taking place? If we are comparing line upon line, we have the messages of Haggai, we have Zechariah, and now we have this with Ezra. Darius searched for this decree and found it, whereupon he directed those who had made the inquiry to allow the rebuilding of the temple to proceed. Let the work of this house of God alone, he commanded. Let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews build this house of God in his place. Yeah, so as we talked about, yes, last Sabbath. Right. You know, know that this is going to be in 520, 519 BC, that the messages of Zechariah and Haggai are given. Right. In 520. And then that's going to cause God's people to commence this building. Right. To to recommence the building of the temple. And then there's going to be obviously uh the search in the records because the people are going to oppose this. And this is going to take time. But Ellen White is clear that Darius's decree happens more than 20 years after uh, Cyrus's decree, but less than 20 years after they return to Jerusalem under Cyrus's decree. So right. it helps us place Cyrus's decree exactly in the summer of 516 BC. But these events here would be in 520, 519. So the search probably is happening in 518, 517, somewhere around there. So it's going to take time for this search to occur. And Ella White's writing, she just says, you know, the search happened and, you know, they found it and then he issues a new decree. But anyway. That's just a review of what I talked about last time. And it was well presented then. Moreover, Darius, Darius continued, I make a decree what ye shall do to the elders of the Jews for the building of this house of God, that of the king's goods, even of the tribute beyond the river, forthwith expenses be given unto these men that they be not hindered. 
and that which they have need of, both young bullocks and rams and lambs, for the burnt offerings of the God of heaven, wheat, salt, wine, and oil, according to the appointment of the priests which are at Jerusalem, let it be given them day by day without fail, that they may offer sacrifices of sweet savors unto the God of heaven, and pray for the life of the king and of his sons. Ezra 6, 7 and 10. The king further decreed that severe penalties will, would be meted out to those who should in any wise alter the decree. And he closed with the remarkable statement that God hath caused his name to dwell there, destroy all kings and people that shall put to their hand to alter and to destroy this house of God, which is at Jerusalem. I Darius have made a decree let it be done with the speed verse 12 thus the Lord prepared the way for the completion of the temple <clears throat> for months before this decree was made the Israelites had kept on working by faith the prophets of God still helping them by means of timely messages through which the divine purpose of Israel was kept before the workers. This time of rebuilding the temple, is this any different from the time that we are in now, post July 18th? Is the temple to be built first or are the people to be gathered first? Well, the people are gathered first. And they build the temple. I mean, it depends what you mean by that. I mean, obviously, you need a temple for the people to be gathered around. Right. But... I mean, their first is the call from Jerusalem, the people leave, or from Babylon, they go to go to Jerusalem. Right. And then, so they leave first, and then they commence the building of the temple. But they're, but they're tied together. Correct. <clears throat> Two months after Haggai's last recorded message was delivered, Zechariah had a series of visions regarding the work of God in the earth. These messages, given in the form of parables and symbols, came at a time of great uncertainty and anxiety and were of peculiar significance to the men who were advancing in the name of the God of Israel. It seemed to the leaders as if the permission granted the Jews to rebuild was about to be withdrawn. The future appeared very dark. God saw that his people were in need of being sustained and cheered by a revelation of his infinite compassion and love. In vision, Zechariah heard the angel of the Lord inquiring, O Lord of hosts, how long will be, wilt thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah? against which thou hast had indignation these threescore and ten years. And the Lord answered the angel that talked with me, Zechariah declared, with good words and comfortable words. Again, Zechariah 1.13. So the angel that communed with me said unto me, Cry thou, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion, with a great jealousy, and I am very sore displeased with the heathen that are at ease. For I was but a little displeased, and they helped forward the affliction. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies. My house shall be built in it, and a line shall be stretched forth upon Jerusalem. 
The prophet was now directed to predict. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, my cities through prosperity shall yet be spread abroad, and the Lord shall yet comfort Zion, and shall yet choose Jerusalem. Zechariah then saw the powers that had scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem, symbolized by four horns. Immediately afterward, he saw four carpenters, representing the agencies used by the Lord in restoring his people and the house of his worship. Here we are instructed to see verses 18 to 21. Now, this is what Sister White had had to say in reference to Zechariah 1. So, All right. Zechariah 2 now. I'm going to go to 2. Okay. All right. So. Is Zechariah 2 now on your screen? Yep. <clears throat> Zechariah 2. The vision of an angel sent to measure Jerusalem and its flourishing state under God's protection is foretold. Verse 6, the people are warned to quit Babylon before its fall. And verse 10, the promise of God's presence. Now, when I was placing this together, I was led to repeat this portion from Manuscripts 175. Again, we are being shown that chapters 2, 3, 4, and 5 are chapters appropriate for our study. We are to learn our lessons from these chapters, for history will be and is being repeated. I lifted up mine eyes again and looked and beheld a man with a measuring line in his hand. Then said I, whither goest thou? And he said unto me, to measure Jerusalem, to see what is the breadth thereof, and what is the length thereof. And behold, the angel that talked with me went forth, and another angel went out to meet him. And said unto him, Run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls for the multitude of men and cattle therein. For I, saith the Lord, will be unto her a wall of fire round about and will be the glory in the midst of her. How protected would we be by a wall of fire? Is that going to offer greater protection than a wall of stone? And the comment from the chat. Here is this wall of fire just like at the Red Sea. Now, this next portion that we're going to read is from a non-published manuscript, Manuscript 149 of 1898. And this one is very difficult to read. It is very difficult to hear, for it applies to us today. 
In the parable, Christ speaks of the invitation being given in the highways and the hedges. As many as ye shall find, he says, bid to the marriage. Matthew 22, 9. The Lord required just as implicit obedience and high principled service from the newly invited guests as from those first called. There must be no mistake made in regard to those called to the heavenly banquet. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he said unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither, not having the wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away and cast him into the outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Matthew 29, 11 to 14. Does this parable apply to us today? Does this parable apply to us within the movement today? Yes, it does. Is it painful to hear this? Well, it's painful in a good way for me because it helps me to see that there's very much more progress spiritually I need to make, and I can only do that with his help. This parable has more a special application to the Christian world today who claim to believe in Christ. The Jewish nation was deciding its own destiny. As a nation, it had already divorced itself from God. Christ's prophetic eye saw in them the man without the wedding garment. Those who had all the privileges and the opportunities of enjoying the richest banquet ever presented to man. They had consented to come. And they had accepted the invitation. But they had refused the garments of Christ's righteousness. In rejecting the only begotten Son of God, they had forever separated themselves from God. Who is the Jewish nation today? Well, Seventh-day Adventists are God's denominated people. Right. <clears throat> so as it says that this parable has more a special application to the Adventist world today, who claim to believe in Christ. The Adventist church was deciding its own destiny. As a nation, as a church, it had already divorced itself from God. This application is not going to please many. Yet, I think it is very specific for us to understand where we stand right now. Do we wish to come without the wedding garment? No. Nope. The Jewish nation had been tested and proved. The nation had been tested. The nation had been proved. Yet individuals still were to be tested and proved. For 2,000 years, the covenant with Jacob had been preserved. For more than 1,000 years, the nation had been granted every favor from the Lord. 
that would call forth their gratitude and cause them to sense their obligation to him. But they had sought their own selfish interests. They had sought their own glory. Their religion was peculiar. The moral law was kept ever before them. The Sabbath was to be observed by them as the memorial of creation. The moral principles of government were in every respect superior to the principles that which controlled other nations. The vineyard was hedged in by the sea and by the mountains. I say it, the Lord will be a wall of fire round about. Zechariah 2.5. As the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so is the Lord round about his people. Psalm 125, verse 2. Every faculty in richest abundance was furnished them that they might become all that the Lord designed that they should be. As a nation, Israel was exalted above every people upon the face of the earth. At Mount Sinai, they were fully organized. The ordinance of public worship was established and God's law engraven with his own finger upon tablets of stone were placed in the ark. In Canaan, they were indeed as a vineyard enclosed. To this people was committed the oracles of God if obeyed, these would preserve them pure and uncorrupted, a nation godly among ungodly nations. But they were unfaithful, disobedient, unthankful, and unholy. Consider that statement for a moment. The Jewish nation rejected the Son of God and the moral government of Jehovah. They taught for doctrine the commandments of men. They were favored with the instruction from the highest teacher the world had ever known. In Christ, the light of heaven shone upon them, and they were instructed as to what constituted true holiness. Love for God and for their neighbor as themselves, but they refused to obey God. They rejected their ruler and their governor. They were constantly longing to adopt the customs of other nations, and they rejected the ambassadors of representing, represented by Christ in the parables. Are we in danger of doing this same thing today? Is rejecting God, refusing to obey him in all things, not what is currently going on right now in the movement, A hand has been extended to come to meet together, to reason together, to look to understand the light that has been coming from the scriptures. Yet, the adoption of the customs of other nations, rather than adopting the word of God has been occurring. So the angel that communed with me said unto me, cry thou saying, thus saith the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with a great jealousy. And I am very sore displeased with the heathen that are at ease. For I was but a little displeased 
and they were helped forward the affliction. Therefore saith the Lord, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies. My house shall be built in it, and a line shall be stretched forth upon Jerusalem. The prophet was now directed to predict. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, my cities through the prosperity shall be spread abroad, and the Lord shall yet comfort Zion, and shall yet choose Jerusalem. Zechariah then saw the powers that had scattered Judah. <clears throat> Israel and Jerusalem, symbolized by four horns. Immediately afterward, he saw four carpenters representing the agencies used by the Lord in restoring his people and the house of his worship. So what are these four carpenters, according to Mrs. White? Well, she says they're the agencies. Okay, go on, Angela. I just said they're God, God's, God's prophets that urge, urge them on to keep re rebuilding. Well, I would think the agencies here would be referring to the, four, the, the three angels' messages plus the fourth. Because these are messages, these agencies. Are they also not the messages that, that are coming from the studies that we have been doing? Right, which are oh, man. which are the, the three angels' messages plus the fourth. Right. That's how we've been drawing them out as these lines that, that show a parallel with Millerite history. Those that do not seek to understand the lessons of the past are doomed to repeat the failures. If we are not willing to study what has gone on before with our spiritual fathers, Are we then not choosing to separate ourselves from God? I lifted up mine eyes again, Zacharias said, and looked, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. Then said I, whither goest thou? And he said unto me to measure Jerusalem to see what is in the breadth thereof and what is in the length thereof. And behold, the angel that talked with me went forth and another angel went out to meet him and said unto him, run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls for the multitude of men and cattle therein. For I, saith the Lord, will be under her a wall of fire round about and will be the glory in the midst of her. Zechariah 2, 1 to 5. Going back to these agencies, this is a statement from the publishing ministry. It's also councils, writers, and editors. Um, let it never be forgotten that these, uh, in square brackets, publishing institutions, are to cooperate with the ministry of the delegates of heaven. These are among the agencies represented by the angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, etc. So she equates these agencies with the messages. But exactly. it's also the institutions that, that present those messages. So it's the presentation of these messages.
God had commanded that Jerusalem be rebuilt. What is Jerusalem here? What is Jerusalem in our day? Well, I mean, it's the city that's set on a hill. It cannot be hid, right? The message that is to go to the world. Right. The vision of the measuring of the city was an assurance that he would give comfort and strength to his afflicted ones and fulfill to them the promises of his everlasting covenant. His protecting care, he declared, would be like a wall of fire round about. And through them, his glory would be revealed to all the sons of men. That which he was accomplishing for his people was to be known in all the earth. Cry out and shout, thou inhabitants of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee. And now look at this. This is recorded in Isaiah 12, 6. No symbol there, right? You have the 126, of course, yeah. So in this verse, we are to offer to cry out. We are to shout because we are inhabiting Zion, his special land. Because God has made it clear that he is our protector. He is our comfort. He is our instructor. Now, as we have been looking at this today, we have looked at the various visions to try to come to a closer understanding of the experience that we as a people are going to be required to have. The experience of Zechariah, like the experience of Daniel, like the experience of John the Revelator, is to be ours. We have to make a choice, brothers and sisters. With whom do we stand? God has commanded that his prophecies go forward. God has commanded that all of the earth is to be warned. God has commanded that Jerusalem is to be rebuilt. When God says something, is he capable of doing exactly what he says? Is that a hard question? No, obviously God can do exactly what he says. Then where is our faith?
We are being measured now. Our characters are being compared with the divine pattern. We need to consider <clears throat> if we have given all, if we have allowed him to remove that from us that is nothing but dross. We need to consider if we are going to be wearing the wedding garment that is presented to us, or if we are going to wear a garment of our own choosing. Do we want to be in the wedding feast or do we want to be in the outer darkness? What say you today? Now, we have choices. We are coming somewhat close to the close of our time today. Are there questions or comments that any would like to make? Um, I'm looking at uh, Zechariah chapter 2, yes, verse uh, 1 to 5, the way it is written. Yes, it's uh, yeah, uh, I'm seeing a uh, 2:15, which is half of the uh, 4:30, the time the children of Israel spent uh, that's uh, to do with captivity. There's the 2:15, the, the time that um, uh, Isaac was persecuted by S by Ishmael. Then uh, up to the time that they came out uh, from Egypt. Right. So you're speaking of the 215 years from when the promise had been given with Abraham. Yes, I'm seeing a symbolism in the 215. Okay. Which is Zechariah chapter 2, verse uh, 1 to 5. All right. Any other thoughts or comments? Well, the idea here, just even when you look at this measuring line, right, right to verse one. So we know we have a measuring line um, in uh, Ezekiel 40, right? That's a measuring read. And also we see the same thing in Revelation chapter 11, verse one, right? Right. So, so we have tied, of course, 11-1, the symbol there, to January 11th, right? So that, that's going to be sort of the end of that line, that prophetic mirror that's given um, through Colin's study, right, that ends on January 11th. And um, so in Zechariah 2, verse 1, we have, of course, then this measuring line. And this measuring line here, is just as it is mostly it's either a building or a judgment right so here he's going to take this measuring line and he's going to measure jerusalem that's the breadth and the length so very similar to uh, ezekiel 40 and, and on um now as far as ending it in verse five um i don't know what it has as far as uh in the Hebrew manuscripts, whether there's a break there. But in 2 verse 6, it says, ho, ho. Well, that same word is um, uh, the word that's often translated as woe, right? Right. Ho, ho, come <laughs> forth, woe, or it could be woe, woe, you know, whatever, however you want to look at it. 
Um, now it's the Hebrew number 1945. So that right. of course reminds me of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Right. Now to to be specific, the translators and from the Hebrew, yeah, they have make this yeah. another paragraph break. Right. So so you can see there is that natural break from two verse one to five right there right. in in the Hebrew manuscripts, that paragraph marking. Correct. Okay. And so this is this is why when when I was reviewing this today, it was more of an idea for us to end going through verses one through five and to pick up the study this next week, beginning in verse six. Yeah. yeah, and so you can see then how that fits in what uh, our brother there was talking about as far as the 215. Exactly. Because that's the first half of the 430. It can also be referred to the second half as well. I mean, it's because both are 215 years. Right. Um, so it's kind of interesting. Very much. Okay. Any other questions or comments at this time? All right. Shall we then close with prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for these good words, for these comfortable words, as they are presented. We ask now, Father, for your guidance and direction through the rest of this day. We thank you for the time that we've been able to spend in study together. We thank you for the many thoughts, comments that have been presented. Direct us now. Help us so that that which we do may glorify your name. That we may lift up that which you would have us to lift up. To do the work that you would have us to do at this time in this earth's history. For this, Father, we thank you. This opportunity. For these blessings, we praise you. Now and always, in Jesus' name, amen.